Hello, everyone. I'm Winter Molinex, Narrative Director for Cryptic Studios. With me today, I've got the incredible R.A. Salvatore and Gino Salvatore, as well as Randy Massons, our Creative Director. So today we're going to be asking some questions about North Dark Reaches. First and foremost, thank you guys so much for joining us. Of course. Fun to be here. Again. After several years. <laughs> well, gentlemen, what's your involvement with Neverwinter's new module, North Dark Reaches, and what's coming with the next module? I'm doing the new series, The Way of the Drow, which is a trilogy, kind of completing the circle of the Legend of Driss almost. And uh, when you guys over at uh, Cryptic reached out to me and said, you know, we want to do more modules, it's perfect time because it just fits right in with the books that I'm doing because there's so much going on, particularly in the Dark Elf City. So Gino and I came on to help create the story with you guys for North Dark, and it's been a lot of fun. It's been an amazing experience on our end because we we loved reading the material that you provided. Yeah, and you then, saw it before the readers saw it. <laughs> we, we did, we did. Yeah. And we we kind of started weaving a story together, like what we thought could go in between these stories, and we presented that to you. And just seeing like where your mind was going and what you wanted to portray between the books was was fascinating, and it was a fantastic collaboration. How about, how about you, Gino? Well, uh, my involvement has been going between because my father is a very busy person writing books as well, and this does involve quite a lot of additional uh, writing and details. So I've been primarily functioning to uh, help bridge the gap between story and game story so to speak there is a yep. gap there there has to be to make mm-hmm. both work novels and games do different things yep. it's an true. interesting gap it's an interesting constraint to have to work where you're trying to tell certain pieces of a story that need to fit alongside novels but you're constrained by the rules of the game world and that's fun to work in actually so can you tell us a little bit about the two-part storyline you helped create for north dark reaches and the next module yeah, well, when, I, when I'm doing the three books, they're working in two different places. One involves the companions of the hall and Dritz up at the surface, the continuation of the story that's been going on. And the other one, the one that's involved with North Dak Reaches, has to do with the budding civil war that's happening in, in Men's Baron's Arm, the Dark Elf City. So that's like hinted at in the first two books. This, this section is devoted to it, but it's, it's really, it's just still building. All the suspense is building. The, the houses are kind of lining up on one side. Either they're with Loth or they're against Loth. And this has been going on since the last Stritz trilogy when the main house created this big heresy. And so the city's in turmoil. And there's, there's obviously something really big, bad coming. And, you know, I want to point out that it's, it's certainly going to be different in the book than the players are going to experience. You know, there are some things that are the same, like what's the goal? But players are going to write their own story. But, but it's fun to explore the, a lot of these little side stories, especially in the different format, like, like Gina was saying, of a game. That, that does lead uh, to our next question, actually. So what led you and the Cryptic team to decide and make the storyline portray events in between the first two books in your latest trilogy series, Way of the Drow? Is it because there were more stories to tell within the Way of the Drow universe? Partly. And the other reason is just timing. I mean, you couldn't tell some of the stories that are in the books if I hadn't written them yet, because I don't know what I'm going to put in the books half the time until <laughs> I get there. So these books always take twists and turns when I'm going. And I, if I had you say, well, here's what's going to happen. You have to have the characters go and do X, Y, and Z. And then in the books, they get the X and then they go back the other way to W and V or whatever. Instead of Y and Z, then wait a minute, this isn't how it happened in the books, but it won't be. It can't be uh, exactly the same. You don't want it to be because it could take too much suspense away. And, they, and again, it, it, it just plays in a different type of format. These are new heroes. The heroes, the, the people playing the game, their characters aren't in my books. You know, they're telling their own stories. Um, but and then the, the other reason, I, again, was just because, you know, we started doing this when I was writing, probably right when I started writing Glacier's Edge. And I had no idea what was going to happen as I go through the whole book. I'm a, I'm a complete pantser. I'm not a plotter. Um, <laughs> I, I, I come up with a plot and then I start writing and the characters go, no, 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 that's not what happened. Let us tell you what happened. So 
it's just it's practical and it's also I think more fun this way. And, awesome. and the end result that we hope for all of us is that if you've read the books and you play the game, a lot of things will make more sense to you or yeah. you know be clearer like what's at stake. And if you played the game and then you want to you go to read the books, the books will show you some of the things you saw in the game from a different perspective of the characters in the books. Always fun to get that. Oh, hey, I know that guy. <laughs> when you're playing games, yeah. right? hey, I, I recognize that person. Yeah, and then one of the the best parts about doing something like this is the ability to stick little Easter eggs in and see who catches them. Right. That was one of the most exciting things for me, working with the two of you. Um, even though I've known you folks forever, like this is the first time I actually got to work with you. And so <laughs> it, it was nice to see these characters come to life in a different way. Um, Randy, I think you might have some insight on this. Why did we choose to go in between the books uh, from a design perspective as well? Well, I, I, I think, you know, part of it is is just uh, good timing, right? We When we, uh, we decided to go back to the Underdark and we reached out to uh, to the Salvatores about this, it, it happened to line up with the with the Way of the Drow trilogy. And and uh, when we, we talked about uh, splitting it up into two types of modules, it, it actually lined up pretty well between them. So that just seemed like a natural fit and a natural sense of direction for the gameplay we were doing. So, um, as for the next question, what is your favorite part of the storyline in North Dark Reaches? My favorite part of North Dark Reaches was the villains. I really enjoy writing villains in general because uh, I'm such a fantastic, righteous, upstanding citizen that writing people who aren't is a lot of fun for me. <laughs> uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no he likes writing villains because it gives him ideas of how to kill us in his D&D game on Sunday. Night. That's <laughs> also not false. Uh, I really enjoyed the villains in North Dark Regions, and I also really enjoy the villains in the one that's coming next. Um, they might be a little bit more recognizable, but both groups of, of bad guys have some history, and it's fun to explore. I also really enjoyed in uh, North Dark Regions, I really enjoyed Rump It Up uh, as well. As a character, he was a lot of fun to engage with. Uh, there is yeah. something delightfully gross about the way uh, Mike and Ed's communicate that <laughs> is, um, really fun to, to play with and hope the players are you know getting a little bit okay that's that, that's great but you know, it's better than spider webs yes that's what you get going through Menzo Burns huh? my favorite part of North Dark Reaches was that I was done with the first book before all of this hit it got me thinking in different ways about the storyline that was really secondary in the first mm-hmm. two books that's when I realized that Braylon was going to be such a big player in this story uh, as the M- one of the NPCs in- as we went forward with this. But the thing I really liked was the whole the setup. Again, before you get into where we're at, we are in the books, the, the, the mood we had to set in that trail down to Menzo Baron's on. Because I couldn't just have, especially with, you'll understand better when you read Loaf's Warrior, the, the number of groups that are going down there in different ways. I can't just have them all in Menzo Baron's on. It's getting there is part of the fun. And that, and of course, the North Dark Reaches really showed a lot of that, right? It really showed the areas before you get to the city and other areas were created just for that. But now they get a reference point in the books or in the last book, or, you know, they make sense in the last book which makes it more fun for me because I was able to incorporate my creative process on these other projects. It, it kind of all blended together. We're going to a place in Menzo Baranzan that I've only barely touched upon. I think this came from you, Winter. <laughs> Actually, the idea of, of going to a place that got destroyed in a really weird way and thrown somewhere. And I don't want to give anything away, but um, the idea of going and exploring that ruin, if you will, really appeals to me and may become a dungeon someday that I'll kill my D&D and characters with. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was very cool. So all of that, that whole storyline that came out of you and then Gino and work, bringing it to most of that to me that I was able to then dig into was um, my favorite part. That, that has been one of my favorite things about collaborating with the two of you. It wasn't like prescriptive. We explored things together and then we just kind of saw where it went. Yeah. And it was very organic. 
Yes. Um, I love that. Um, Randy, do you have a favorite part of North Dark Reaches? Visually, uh, I think one of, one of my favorite places is the is actually the Lake of the Carrion King. I think the environment team uh, did a great job at at uh, bringing those elements to life. The sporing tunnels are also great. Speaking of of myconids and the their habits, ways of communicating and everything, because that is a, a focal point for. The Mykonids, who are allies, friends in, in, in the situation, and that's almost like a, a sacred place to them. It is a place where they commune and, and like share stories, uh, and that, that's also uh, visually they did a fantastic job for that. So I guess I'm I'm pro Mykonid. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I love the Mykonids. I I think my favorite part of the story though was that we got to go between your two books, but then we got to look at other source material as well um, that you've been a large inspiration for, like Out of the Abyss. And we pulled characters like Rumpadump and other characters that won't be named to uh, not spoil the surprise, but we, we got to really pull those in and make it a cohesive part of the Underdark ecosystem. And yeah, it was, nice. to me, just a dream come true, honestly. I love the whole setting. So, your fans love your characters, Bob. Are there any fan favorites that players can expect to meet in North Dark Reaches? Drizzt, perhaps? Yeah, I would I would think there are. Um, you know, this is, this is a guy who wears an eye patch that shows up <laughs> as we go along, and and Drizzt is there, and yeah, let's not give too much away. Yeah. And the guy I really hope will become a fan favorite is, is Braylon. Mm. Because he's become my favorite. <laughs> One yeah. Of. yeah. And he's a real focal point uh, for, for the North Dark Reaches. So that's, yeah. it's great. How about, how about you, Gino? Are there fan favorites that you want to call out or point out? Or I agree. Braylon is very cool. I think Rumpadump is fantastic. Uh, Sarah Bell and Minol and Faye, who are both uh, favorites of mine. So yeah. I don't know if, you, if they're fan favorites, but I'm really happy to have both of them uh, involved in North Dark Reaches. What do you like most about writing with video games in mind? Well, one of my favorite parts of writing books is world building. You know, in the book, you're walking down the road, looking through the eyes of my characters. You're living vicariously through the characters I'm giving you in the book, if you will. But I like to make the world around them fairly complete. So my job becomes creating the environment and the quest and the journey for your character. And really focusing on that. That's some of my favorite parts of writing these books. It's creating the world. I am a fan of working with constraints. I like writing graphic novels. I like writing for other media besides just books. And I really like writing for video games because the constraints are so specific. It has to be able to work within the systems of the game. It has to be able to work with the the budget for the game, the art budget. The more things you want to throw into a, a game, the more time it takes, the more artists it takes. So... You, know, you have restrictions on what you can do. Taking those restrictions and, and taking a story, an idea, a concept, and running it through those restrictions and coming out with something good on the other end, uh, to me, is a fascinating exercise. Distilling it through the, the rules that you have to follow to turn that into a game and ending up with quality product on the other end of it. That's, that's mm-hmm. my favorite yeah. part of it. And then the second thing is, I agree, the fact that the main character is the player creates a really interesting dynamic for the story where the story has to function around the player and also through the player without ever feeling like you're forcing the player to do something. And that also uh, is an interesting um, and sometimes challenging uh, constraint that, again, I enjoy very much building through. See, that's why I need them on these projects because (laughs) on the first part, on the first part, I'm exactly the opposite, right? I want to just run wild. I, and when I'm writing in the realms these 35 years, but the biggest job I have before I write the book is find a place where nobody else is so I can just mm-hmm. go crazy. Um, so you guys would probably hate me <laughs> if, I didn't have the, uh, if I didn't have the guide rail known as Gino. <laughs> yeah. I, I've never really been able to operate with the go somewhere else uh, style, but then again, there's never been an opportunity presented to me. So it works out. How about you, Randy? What's your favorite part of writing for games? Well, in, it's always interesting writing for games, uh, especially when, uh, you know, um, 
Bob talks about the world building aspects and, and, you know, I really enjoy world building myself. We've got a, uh, but of course for video games, especially action focused video games, there's a lot of, uh, world building you need to do as, as part of visual storytelling, right? Um, we, where you're setting up, up the, up the environments that the characters exist in, the ambient behaviors that is, that's happening because all of that tells us, tells a part of the story as well, right? Like, and you're writing a book, of course, you're, you're focused on you know, you know, painting a picture for the reader. And uh, with the video games, you're, you are, that's a, that's a aspect of what you're doing, but you, you're there, people aren't necessarily there to read uh, stuff. They want to hear the voice of the characters, which is audio aspects is of, of course, you know, a big part of that casting the right characters, uh, getting the, getting the right uh, nuances of the, of the voice and manner across, uh, you, you know, all about that winter. Um, and uh and also just kind of setting the environment, setting the stage for the, for, for the, uh, the, that the players are going to be experiencing the, this environment in. bringing those parts all together, I think is, is like the, you know, what I find joy in, right. Is, is, uh, setting the stage in way, which you have the gameplay and the storytelling aspects all together. I, I would say my favorite part falls in line with a lot of what, uh, the three of you said. I, I love the world building aspect, but for me, I tend to lean into the speculative side of things. Like, what does this say about me through this character? What does this say about somebody else through this character? What is this character exploring for people? Mm -hmm. I like um, sort of going into that deeper psychological element in my head. I get I get a little too into it when I'm writing. And <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I just get really deep and involved in, in all of that. And so I love seeing how everybody's different approach comes together to create a collaborative whole that's just so unique for the player experience. What excited you most about collaborating again with Cryptic for story content in Neverwinter? Well, the first time went really well. We had, I had a lot of fun. It was my other son, Brian, was actually working on that one with me. And we had, we had a lot of fun with that, especially because I got to do so much with Thibbledorf Point. And some of the designs you guys came up with for Point. And so the, when I saw him in the game, I almost like, I almost fell out of my chair laughing um, because it was just perfect. And that to me is, you know, what this whole thing is about. It's what yeah. this whole career of mine is and why it's, why it's a, it's a, it's a hobby and a job all at once because of the community, because of the, the fact that it's bigger than just the things I'm working on. So being able to go and work with, with you guys, being able to go work in other areas and still do this and seeing other people bringing things like, the upcoming campaign pieces that you created that kind of is like inspiring me back. And someday I may go there <laughs> in the book. I love that. I absolutely love hearing that. That's one of my favorite parts of collaborating with you folks. It's just, uh, it's, as I said, organic and just like this, this natural flow of ideas. Was the process or experience different from the original collaboration uh, for the eighth module? It was. It was because when we did it the first time, I think it was much more structured yep. in terms of, um, because I think the timing was a lot tighter up front. Brian had been doing exactly this type of thing at 38 Studios before, you know, when they, when they kind of went away. And so he knew exactly what we needed to put in there. So my input, I think, on a creative level was, was more up front. But then I kind of stepped back from it. Whereas with this one, Gina and I playing back and forth a lot more as we go along. Randy, do you have anything to add to that? Like, was the process or experience different from the original collaboration of the eighth module? When we we were doing the uh, MA, or sorry, eighth module um, for Neverwinter, it was one of the first times we really did a like collaboration like this. So we were trying to figure out what's the best way to communicate all the elements of our right. game uh, to uh, to an outside person who would be writing, writing a lot of the story elements. So uh, one of the things we, we try to portray is like, okay, this is how our quest structures work. This is how, how everything is linked together, et cetera, because right. we have to assume that you know, uh, we, that uh, whoever we were giving this information to didn't, didn't really necessarily know a lot of the mechanical elements of the game, right? So we wanted to do our best to say, hey, here are the boxes to work, work, work within in terms of communicating something that we can turn into a story. One of the things that, that worked well in, in, in that sense was um, 
the uh, the story we told with with the with the eighth with their first underdark module was very structured. Like we had a bunch of instance missions where where like you know you and your team would go into as opposed to a shared environment because when it, once you have like a shared static space, you have less specific implementations you can do uh, because you're 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 uh, in a shared space with other people. So you can't have people running in and out and everything. But with missions, you can do a bit more storytelling, more structured storytelling where where uh, certain things happen and cutscenes happen where characters come in come out etc so um the, it, I, I think most of that was instance so we were able to do a little bit more of the structured storytelling in that sense and with the with the the newer releases we're doing it's a, a bit of mix of both like we have a lot of storytelling that's happening within the zone and then we have a few instances uh, that that can, are, are for focal points. In addition to that, we now have somebody helping the Neverwinter team who is more familiar with the publisher side of things as well. So basically, I was able to look at the process and say, you know, video games and and publishing and everything else works a bit differently. Let's uh, let's refine this a bit and make sure that we're servicing both sides equally. And Randy and I worked together with the design team and you folks to, to really pull that process together and refine it for the next module. So who knows if there's ever another collaboration again in the future, it'll be smoother than ever. The other thing is, I think you guys are, are way more tuned into the realms. I mean, how many years now? You guys know the realms better than I know the realms, oh. I think. We it, yeah we're coming up on our tenth anniversary next year uh, for, yeah, for Neverwinter, I mean, and uh, a lot of the realms now are probably inspired by things that you've been doing over 10, 10 years. So it the back and forth it's like you're more you're more at home there now as well. I think <laughs> yeah it was really interesting working with with uh, Neverwinter over the last like decade plus of of time. There's a lot of uh, places there that you know, we we actually took from modules, uh, from places uh, that, that were established in the realms. Uh, but we also introduced a lot of a lot of original stuff too, which is then you see in uh, new the new rule books, it's like, hey, that's the stuff that we did. That, that's yeah. great, kind of cool. And it's it's interesting to have that kind of collaboration back and forth and everything and, and developing this 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 world together is, is fantastic. There's you know elements from from uh, Neverwinter game that has made made their way into some tabletop games, and and we have people talking to you about, hey, we met Dritz in in a tabletop game. We have people that, that you know talk about taking elements that have introduced in, in our game into their tabletop games as well. So it's nice seeing that kind of flow of creativity you know, I keep, I keep on going. You just reminded me of something. One of the things that that really made me want to jump in in the those ten those eight years ago or whatever it was. Yep. Um, one of the things that really made me want to jump in is you guys find because of when we had that meeting at Watts at Wizards. Basically, they said to me, "Are, are you going to be working on the, at anywhere near the Sword Coast in your next book?" And the next book was going to be Gauntlegrim at that time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I said, "Yeah, actually, I am." And they said, "Think you can blow up a city for us?" Right, because <laughs> they want all new, right? Because you guys were taking over Neverwinter, so it's going to be all new assets, and so they wanted the city flattened. So I get to blow up Gondolgrim. If you work in a shared world and you love blowing up cities, you know how frustrated <laughs> you get as the years go by, and they won't let you. And here, you guys come along and say, "Well, you blow up a city for me. Now. I'm in." <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> yeah. Just push on the TNT bar. Just boom. <laughs> What appeals to you about the Underdark, and were you excited to revisit it in a video game medium? For me, it's not really revisiting; it's visiting. I've right. never really worked strongly in the Underdark before uh, for this at all. Uh, the Underdark is a, if not entirely unique, it is a very rarely explored space in in video games. The the whole idea, or rather, in fantasy fiction, uh, underground worlds are interesting inherently, and um, the Underdark is one of the older, fully fleshed out, massive uh, spaces uh, under a world that has its own ecosystem, that has its own setup. So it's just not the sort of space that I get to work in often. And I'm very happy about that. Previously, I've worked on the surface world in uh, Forgotten Realms a few times, and I love the realms. Uh, but I was definitely excited to get to delve under the surface for a little while. And how about you, Bob? What what appeals to you about the Underdark, and were you excited to revisit it in a video game medium? 
what have I not been listening yet? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, what appeals to me about it? Well, you know, I think one of the central places in there is 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 a place called Menzo Berenzan that I know a little about and kind of created. What I really love about visiting in, in the video game now is I really love that we're finally starting to do some some visuals of it more than just the static book cover, if you will. You know, this started also with that that little draw lullaby poem that I wrote for Sleep Sound when we had, you start to see the Underdark differently. Now remember when I started writing in the Underdark, it was a lightless place and they had infravision and the time clock of Menzo Berenzan heated up. It didn't glow. It just got hot and the heat told them what time it was by how high the heat had risen up the pillar. So it was very different. And I always, I always figured back then if they were ever going to make like an Underdark Dritz movie, they could just do a black screen and have people talking <laughs> and hitting swords together behind the, <laughs> behind the scenes. But now, now seeing how we're re-exploring that space and trying to give it visual beauty as well. And, you know, beauty and horror, right? Which, which, mm-hmm. it, it's becoming way more interesting to me. It's mm-hmm. like when you, you know, when you pull up a story about some cave they discovered and you go in, in Mexico or somewhere, there was one I saw that they had discovered in Mexico. And when they went down there, they found these giant crystals and they find and the colors and the, and the, you know, you put the light on. It's like when you go in the ocean and you put the light on the fish and the coral reefs and stuff and all this explosion of colors, or you put, put the Hubble telescope or the new telescope and you point them out at the universe and you see this explosion of colors where there was just black. And that's how I feel about the underdark right now. It's like I'm seeing it coming back at me in images that aren't just on the cover of a book. And that's really exciting for me. That has to feel awesome. Randy, uh, what appeals yeah. to you about the underdark? Were you excited to revisit it? Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the underdark is, I think, a great, great place. There's so much to it. We're just we're taking one aspect of it, like North Dark Reaches. And previously, we we touched on Mantle Dareth and, and uh, some places around that. But the area is is huge. It's pretty much a underworld that, that exists across most of Faroon and Faroon is pretty big, but just thinking that there is like this whole, like multiple civilizations that, that are, that are underneath the world as well is, is just like a great aspect to it. And I think maybe uh, some of the first impression people get is like underdark. Oh, it's just caves. You're going to caves and like, Yes, but uh, there, there's just so much that you can explore in terms of how many of the Underdark races that have built civil, whole civilizations there, not just the Drow, but the, the Dwargar, the Mykonids, the, et cetera. Each of them have their own kind of expression about what their what their life and culture is like. And bringing those things to, to life gets, gets into exploring different cultures, different worlds, different ways people live is different uh, than, than the overworld. And kind of was like, well, this, this is the way it works uh, you know, above ground, but what is the situation? Like you mentioned the Narbondel, right? It, it was just originally heats up and cools down and everything. And that that's changed a bit where, where it is more of a, a light and dark progression as well. And that changes certain aspects of, of the way it's visually presented. Uh, always excited when we can go to the Underdark and flesh out new new areas to explore because there's a lot there and we barely touched the under service. <laughs> yeah, and there's commerce. One of the things when I'm writing the books, one of the first things I try to figure out as I figure out the society is the geography. Because what type of land you live in is going to determine an awful lot about how you live. Mm-hmm. If you live in a land of plenty that's like near a lake full of fish, you're going to be fishermen. But if the, there aren't that many fish and there are other tribes, you're going to fight over them. If you're not one of the people that lives in the land of plenty, you might want to take something from them. And so it, this is the way our whole history evolved. It, exactly. And it, it's why some nations became very good at things like war machines, <laughs> while other nations didn't understand why you would bother. And now you've got this underdark and it, it, the possibilities are endless, right? We could find a whole new race of sentient beings that are completely different in a different place in the underdark. Yeah, if you take a map of the Forgotten Realms and you look at a map of the Forgotten Realms, it's very, very detailed. And you can get into very minute detail across the entirety of that landscape. And if you take a map of the underdark, it's not. Despite the fact that it's huge, some places are defined. There are 
multiple civilizations and there are lots of really cool and interesting things to that have already either been detailed or that you know you can imagine and explore but we don't know how deep the underdark goes and we don't know how big it expands that's it's it's alien it's a frontier it's 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 the gray box wilderness. of the Forgotten Realms. <laughs> yeah. It is. Remember the it original is. gray box of the Forgotten Realms? One of the things that really drew me to the world was that you had these areas that were fairly detailed, and then you had this town here that had a little paragraph about it. Oh, Long Saddles run by the Harpels, who are an eccentric family of wizards that live in the Ivy Mansion on a hill. That's it. Yeah. And then there are these other places that are just groups, whispers. Completely unknown. That's the end of that now. And even those who live down there are never quite comfortable traveling through there because it's so wild and so unexplored and so yeah. dangerous too. That's another element of it. You get a, an element of danger anytime you deal with anything Underdark related uh, that you don't necessarily get other places in the realms. There, there can be plenty of challenges and dangers and there are definitely dangerous places on the surface world, but it's not as automatic uh, as it is if you're walking through an underdark tunnel. Yeah, that's where where why you get get such organizations that that spring up like the Guild of Underdark Guides. You know, it's a it's a thing in the realms. And and uh, if if this is your first foray into an underdark, you better you better hire one of those so you can avoid all of the hazards that that you talked about. And think about the dangers when the path becomes too well traveled from the underdark to the surface. Then it just makes it easier for for bad things to get out. <laughs> yep. I also loved that the Underdark, in addition to being, as you mentioned, the gray box, it's a literal parallel. It's a literal and a figurative parallel where you can explore that that more speculative aspect, like what would people do in this circumstance? How can we really know? We don't live in that circumstance, but let's find out. And I think that's that's a really beautiful element of it. That really appeals to me, and that's something that I love exploring in the video game medium. We hope you'll join us in North Dark Reaches this November 8th on Neverwinter on PC, Xbox, and PlayStation. Thank you so much, Ari Salvatore and Gino Salvatore, for joining us. We really, really, really enjoyed working with you, and we look forward to our continued collaboration on the next module. Can't wait to see you guys in game. 